Like him or loathe him, I think James Suckling reviews the biggest diversity of wines among the American wine critics. He has a big team, he reviews wines from Australia, even China. Now he's going into Eastern Europe like Hungary, Serbia, he does a lot of South America. You know what, his scores might be a bit high, but I like his top 100 wines of the year list because usually it's a little bit more diverse. There are a lot of aspirational wines on the list, and for me, I, I don't care about just drinking aspirational, expensive wines. I want wines that are unique, have character. That's what I'm looking for. I've been doing these reaction to top 100 lists for a few years now. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'll go through these 100 wines and these are 15 that I would actually buy and I'm excited about regardless of price. And I'll throw a few bonus ones in there too. Let's get started. Number 100, the Lopez de Heredia Viña Tondonia Gran Reserva from Rioja 2004. This is an expensive wine. I love Lopez de Heredia. It's an old school winemaking style. There's no stainless steel in the facilities. It's all wood. The wines are aged for a long time and this is an expensive wine. But if you can't afford this, I would say go for the Viña Tondonia Reserva, which is about 70 bucks in the US, or the Viña Cubillo, which is like 30 bucks in the US and if you get it in Spain it's a lot less. Number 93 of the Domaine Favely Mazé Chambertin Grand Cru 2022. Mazé Chambertin is in the village of Gevry Chambertin and it's right next to the more prestigious more expensive Chambertin vineyard. Mazé Chambertin is a vineyard dedicated entirely to Pinot Noir. I like the wines that Domaine Favely make especially because they're fairly available when it comes to Burgundy. This is one of the less expensive wines coming from this crew. I think it's about $200. I have not tasted this wine yet. That's why I want it. I've tasted a lot of wines from Feverly, which I absolutely love. Next up, we have number 92, the Clarendon Hills Grenache McLaren Vale Blewitt Springs Romas 2022. This is from Australia. I love the old vine Grenache in Australia. Fun fact is Australia and California have some of the oldest vines in the world, even older than Europe. I like the Grenache from Australia because it doesn't try to be anything it's not. It's usually pure Grenache, it's usually light in color, strawberry flavors, a lot of pepper, and what I like about this wine in the US, I think it's about 70 bucks, which is pretty good bang for your buck. Number 81, the Tatanger Comte de Tatanger Rosé 2012. I picked this wine, not because I want this wine. I want the Blanc de Blanc, the Chardonnay, the Comte de Tangier Chardonnay, which I think is one of the greatest champagnes that I've ever tasted. It's a prestige cuvee, and while it's expensive, it's not extraordinary. It's not like reaching prices of like Salon, for example. Usually, I think the T Comte de Tangier Blanc de Blanc is around 200, 250 bucks if you can find it. If you want those creamy, toasty, bready flavors and champagne that I absolutely love, I think it's worth checking out. Number 73, the Jean Louis Chave Hermitage Blanc 2018. A couple weeks ago, I actually had a Chave Hermitage Blanc 2013, and it was so funny because when we started drinking it, I was drinking it with my collector group. First, it was a little too oaky. It was still way too young, but after a couple of hours in the glass, it really unfurled. I choose that because while I have a great deal of respect for this wine, I think the most memorable red wines that I've ever had in my life are aged bottles of Ajeo Chave Red Hermitage, and these wines are not cheap. I I don't know, they're three to five hundred dollars a bottle. If you're fortunate enough to taste it, is unlike any experience you've ever had. I mean, it's just your pure rawhide leather with red fruit and pepper and meat notes. It's just really an experience. Number 56 and 53 are not the official wines, but they're wines that are going to show up on the channel. First is the Tenuta San Leonardo 2019. This is one of my favorite wines from Northern Italy. It's a Bordeaux blend, but it's distinctive because usually it's around 13, 13 and a half degrees of alcohol. It's got a 20% of Carmenere in it, which makes it unique. The wine was originally created by the late great Giacomo Takis, who created Sasakaya. These wines are elegant and they age beautifully. You'll see it in an upcoming video. In the next one, you'll see number 53, the Don Melchor Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile, 2022. I actually right now have the 2020. That's going to show up in a video about great Bordeaux blends from around the world. Don Melchor is one of my favorite Cabernet Sauvignons from a long time. When I started drinking these wines, they were a lot less 
less money. I, I think now it's running at 110, 130 bucks, but I remember in the past it was just not even that long, about 60 bucks, and it ages great. Okay, back to wines I really want. Riesling, that's why I like Suckling's List. He has a lot of Riesling. The Dr. Dr. Brooklyn Wolf Riesling Faults, Peckstein, uh, Grand Cru, Grosses Gewachs 2023. Earlier in the year, I did visit Brooklyn Wolf. I love the wines, although they're a little bit pricey here from wines from the Faults. They're a little riper in style, not so mineral driven, more more fruity in terms of Riesling. The Grosses Gewachs wines are absolutely stunning. I had, I think, the 2022 of this, and it was a spellbinding wine. Couple of Sangioveses I want. Let's start out with number 48, the Bibi Graz Toscana Colore, 2022. This producer has really made a name for himself in Tuscany. I think his estate is northwest of Florence. I haven't been there yet. Colore is his top Sangiovese. It's like 200, 250 bucks. I actually have here his Testamata, which is around 100 bucks, also 100% Sangiovese. You'll see this in an upcoming video. Number 47, Isola. E Olena Toscana Ceparello 2021. You saw the 2019 in my Sangiovese Showdown video. Th that was released, I think, earlier this year, or maybe it was last year. Ceparello is one of the original IGT Super Tuscans that was based on 100% Sangiovese. It's always good, it's always delicious. I'll never turn that wine down. Number 38, the Torle Spätburgunder Rheinhessen Orle 2022. Torle is in the Rheinhessen, really underrated producer. Some of their basic wines are just delicious, especially the Spätburgunders and the Rieslings. This is a Grosses Gewax. I've had a lot of wines from the Orle Vineyard, which is fantastic. I think it's up in the north west corner of the Rheinhessen. That's actually where I lived for a couple months back in 2019. I have not tasted this specific wine from Torle. That's why I want to taste it. Not a ridiculous price. It's expensive, but not ridiculous price. German Spätburgunder is really where it's at, guys. Germany has the third most plantings of Pinot Noir in the world behind France and then the USA. And a lot of Spätburgunders are only available in Germany, but they are worth seeking out. Number 35, the Domaine de la Solitude, Chateau of the Pop, Van de Solitude, 2021. Domaine de la Solitude is a historic property just south of the village of Chateauneuf de Pop. I visited before. Florent, or Florence, I think, is in charge now. What they make with the Vin de la Solitude is they make an old school Chateauneuf de Pop, a field blend. It's more medium bodied. I can't remember the last vintage I had of it, but just a completely elegant take on Chateauneuf de Pop. It's their top wine, so it's not cheap, it's not easy to find. If you want a taste of their house style, I think even their Cote de Rhone, which runs at like 15, 16 bucks in the US, is phenomenal. And their Chateau de Pop is great and worth checking out too. Number 29, the Travellini Gatnara Reserva 2019. 2019 is just a phenomenal vintage in all of Italy and Europe for that matter. This is from Piedmont in Italy, the northwest corner of Italy. While Barolos and Barbarescos are climbing up in price, a lot of people are looking to Alto Piemonte, Appalachia like Gattinara, like Gemma, Boca. I've always found that Gattinara wines are pretty balanced and pretty consistent. This one I've had several vintages of. I don't know, I find Gattinara wines are a little bit lighter and just more floral and more pretty than those of Barolo and Barbaresco. This is a gorgeous wine. It's still relatively affordable. Number 21, the Muller Cotois Riesling Faults of Burger Garden in Brumel, Grosses Givax 2023. I was just at the estate earlier this year. You may or may not see this wine coming up on the channel. Okay, number 14, the Wittmann Riesling Rheinhausen Morstein Grosses Givax 2023. I have a Wittmann wine right here that will show up in an upcoming video. I don't think I've released yet. The Morstein is still, I think I had the 2019 was the last vintage I had, is still the most memorable dry Riesling that I've had, period. Right above that, number 13, the Castello di Ama Chianti Classico Gran Selezione San Lorenzo. An older vintage, I think 2019, showed up on the channel a couple years ago. These wines are very beautiful. Castello di Ama, the normal Chianti Classico, is a little bit bigger. The San Lorenzo is a little more delicate, almost burgundy-esque. Of course, it's going to have a little more tannins with the Sangiovese. It's just the type of wine I want to drink all the time. I think it's still a relatively undervalued wine, although it's not cheap. I think anywhere from 40 to 60 something bucks, that's what you're gonna find it for. But it's the type of wine I wanna drink all day long. The next one, number nine, the Tenuta della Terranere Etna Rosso Calderara Sotana 2022. This is from Etna, Sicily, the Burgundy of the Mediterranean made of Norella Mascalese, Norella Cappuccio. I recommend Tenuta della Terranere wines a lot. They're basic Etna Rosso's like 25 bucks in the US. USA. 
Their single vineyard, their Contrada wines are around 50 to 60 bucks, which is still relatively affordable. Etna is just blowing up right now. Basic wines from Etna in general are more expensive than their quality is, but uh, Terranera is an exception. I've had a lot of their single vineyard wines. I have not had this exact one yet, and that's why I want to try it. The moniker, the Burgundy of the Mediterranean, gets overblown sometimes, but once in a while you have an Etna Rosso that really smells Burgundian. Next one, number eight, the Cantina Turlan Pinot Bianco Alto Adige Vorburg Reserva 2021. Cantina Turlan is one of the greatest cooperative wineries in the world in Alto Adige in Italy. Beautiful region. Mountains everywhere. Pinot Bianco really does well there. And even their basic Pinot Bianco for 20, 25 bucks is going to give you a lot of value for money. But if you want to try the Vorberg Reserva, I think this is probably the best Pinot Bianco that I've ever had. Even over ones from Alsace. And then finally, number two, the Kunstler Riesling Rangau Orle Grosses Gewax 2023. I've also been to this estate a long time ago. Kunstler wines, I don't really like all of them, but I have to admit the Ole Grosskvax is an experience. It's just minerals, you have tension, lemon, length for days. I haven't tasted it since 2017, 18. I think it was the last vintage I have. That's why I want this one. So those are the wines that I want to taste. Are there any on your wish list? Have you checked out the James Suckling Top 100 wines of 2024? What do you think of it? I'd love to hear drop it in the comments below.